Katie, and thank you for not doing an internet search on me um, for information. Um, you know, th this issue came to light um, this spring, and uh, obviously foresters were concerned and there wasn't a lot of information, so um, we started digging into it, and we kind of created this goofy little video between the land department and Dovetail called Bat Friendly Forestry, which went viral in the forestry community with over 800 views. Um, <laughs> to put it in perspective, the water skiing squirrel had 2.2 million views, so, <clears throat> but you know, we're a small group, so. But uh, it's, it's got a, a good response, uh, which is uh, evident by the group that's here today, and uh, we want to just talk a little bit about what we found and what we think. Um, it kind of started with the proposed listing of the northern long-eared bat in which a threat, forest management was viewed as a threat to its survival. Loss of roosting habitat and bat mortality during the maternal roosting season, which was defined as uh, in the uh, interim guidance uh, as April 1st to September 30th. Oops. So, so we looked into, or I looked into information that we could find about this, and this was a pretty good publication, and there are copies of it on the back table. Um, it's, it's a good resource, and it's done by Bat Conservation International, so these are bat experts that are putting this together, of some of the forest management strategies um, used to manage for bats. Um, and this was before White Nose Syndrome this was put out. So, so it really talks about all bat species, um, very detailed, and the conclusion we came to is, is we're doing actually a lot of this stuff already in Minnesota in particular. And, and what, what I got from that is basically it's not about what you take but what you leave behind. It's, it, it appears that the habitat characteristics, post harvest, roost tree retention, um, foraging habitat, that, that's really the key. And, and as foresters, we kind of tend to, to look at what we remove from the forest and, and document how much we harvested. But, but this is kind of the flip side of it, looking at, at what you leave behind. And we have a lot of stuff through certification, through the voluntary guidelines in Minnesota that really talk a lot about what we leave behind. Um, retention of trees, snags. So, so we're, we're doing a lot of this stuff already. And, and it uh, should be pretty well documented. So basically, you know, roost trees are key. Um, snags, um, cavity trees, big ugly trees. Um, they can be live trees like Tim talked about. And, and another thing it, it appeared is solar exposure, especially in the, in the summer, is, is pretty important for the warmth um, of the bat species. And there's a picture of, uh, of just uh, basically a an aspen harvest with patch and snags retained um, as an example of uh, some of the things you can do. Our inventory forester has documented snag retention on our lands for a number of years and uh, looking back by forest type, essentially we average retaining about five snags per acre across the forest with an average diameter of 13 inch dbh. Um, so, and it varies by forest type and by DBH, but, but uh, this, this is across harvested areas, um, retained areas. So there are snag trees left out there post-harvest and, and in the forest. So, so a couple of the treatments that I want to look at that, that seem to be, to fit really well within the bat management is for intermediate treatments, taking a look at um, some harvesting where we're looking at variable density thin with patches, with reserve patches incorporated into it. This is an example of a, um, the, the previous slide was an example of an aerial view of, of one of these harvests and this is one of the patches that was harvested for regeneration. So it creates a diverse forest structure um, with, with the large roost trees and then the regenerating forest uh, kind of intermixed. Um, Canopy gaps for foraging. The young forest tends to be pretty good habitat for the insect species that, that the bats feed on. And that increase in vegetation is the reason for that. Basically, that, that 
creates food and uh, shelter throughout the forest. So one of the keys is, is in the thinnings, you know, retaining snag trees or, or evident big ugly cavity trees, which is, which is commonly done. And basically also on the edge of the openings, they're, you know, leave the snag, the cavity trees. A lot of them are created just because of the exposure along the edge of the openings. So, so over time it kind of creates that habitat. And the vegetation, like I said, in the openings, this is a site we're going to visit tomorrow um, where, where Bob made an opening in a hardwood stand and for big tooth aspen growing up in here. So, so basically you have that, that structure which creates pretty good habitat. For regeneration harvest or more even age harvest, um, you know, we look at, there's a lot of aspen management in the lake states and, and you need to do a, essentially a clear cut to get it to regenerate. But again, it's what you leave behind. Um, here's an aerial view of a recent harvest up in the northern part of Aiken County where there's a patch where there are buffers left along wetlands, um, individual trees scattered. The next slide, I'm standing at that vantage point and that's kind of what, what we're looking at. Here's a painted out buffer along a wetland, um, that big patch, some individual trees. It's hard to see, but there's some snag trees in there. So, so incorporating a lot of these concept so, so it's a less, less hostile environment um, for the bat species. And again, this is a clear cut with aggregated retention. And, and we'll talk more about the aggregated retention as a concept a, a bit later. But again, the roosting habitat is there um, as long as it's not too far away from, from the different roosts. Um, you know, the patches that are retained, the snags, the buffers, they all create the roosting habitat. The foraging space is probably in the harvested area where they can get across. And, and again, that, that young forest regeneration creates um, the vegetation that's favorable to the insect prey. Aggregated retention seems to be, in the even age management in the harvest, seems to be um, kind of the favored concept that I can see. But for a couple of reasons. One of them is a sustained flow of roost trees. If you have a patch out there, um, you're gonna have snags in it, you're gonna have cavity trees. As that stand ages, that patch ages, more and more are created over time. So you kind of have more of a flow other than just leaving dead snags scattered out through the harvest, which within a number of years fall down and are no longer a habitat characteristic. The other reason I like it from a forestry standpoint is you're not leaving a bunch of scattered trees throughout the harvested area, which is blocking sunlight, which is impacting your regeneration. So to me, you kind of get the best of both worlds with the aggregated approach. And, you know, looking at, looking at a way to, to look at where, where to leave these, I mean, we have standards that say, you know, you leave X percent, but I think Anchoring those on something is, is an approach that we've used. Um, wetland buffers, you know, large snags, cavities, large down logs, mass trees, conifer inclusions, visual screen, a seed source for regeneration. Those are the types of things to go out and make a decision where you're going to leave these aggregated patches and, and a thoughtful process in doing it rather than just saying, well, let's get my requisite uh, percent out there. So we, we decided, and this was actually before we found out about the northern long-eared issue, we'd been leaving these reserve patches for a number of years and we thought we'd do a follow-up study. We talked to Tony D'Amato from the university and some other people about, you know, do these things really work? Um, and we had a, a, quite a history of doing it. So one of our technicians revisited a, a number of these patches um, over the last year and did some measurements. And what we wanted to find was, you know, what's the function of these patches and are they actually doing what they were supposed to do? Um, we wanted to look at, did it work as a seed source for helping regenerate the adjacent stand? Did it uh, perform the lifeboat function by protecting unique plants and things so they could spread into the adjacent stand? And were they effective at wildlife trees, whether they be cavities, snag trees, coarse woody debris? So we looked at a number of sites throughout the county. Some of them were more than 20 years old um, in certain areas. 
um, somewhere between 10 and 20, and as recently as five-year-old reserve patches, and kind of looked at the gamut to see, to see what they looked like. So what we kind of found out initially is that there was a positive indication that, it was, that these patches were working to seed in the adjacent stand. Um, particularly in aspen regeneration, there was, there was a higher proportion of, of, say, paper birch, red oak, balsam fir close to these, mixed in with the regeneration close to these patches than there was throughout the rest of the stand. The lifeboat function was, was inconclusive. We really did not find a lot of plants that were unique to the patch and, and the regenerating forest, which kind of surprised me. There were a couple, but they weren't necessarily what you'd expect. Um, for the wildlife trees, there was a positive indication. Um, and these were the sites, these were the year of the harvest, and this was the percent of the basal area of the patch that were in snag or cavity trees. So it was a, a pretty significant percentage. On average, throughout the patches, 15% of the standing trees in there were either snags or cavity trees. Um, some of the older ones that had a lower percentage were lower because there were a lot of coarse woody to bring down logs. Some they'd actually fallen down over that course of time. So it kind of proves the point that that creates a mini old forest patch that kind of creates a, a sustainable um, amount of these uh, potential um, roost trees for, for bats and for other species. And as we said, we averaged five snags per acre throughout our forest. The patch study um, averaged about, would be the equivalent of 16 snag trees per acre at about 12 inch dBH. So it basically, there's a disproportionately higher amount within these reserve areas um, than in the forest, forest wide study. So they work for that function. The other thing is the summer harvest issue um, that Tim talked about, you know, the potential for take if, if this species is listed um, by harvesting during the summer roosting season. Well, I think in Minnesota and probably throughout a lot of the lake states, there's a controlling factor to that, and that, are, that is wetlands. And you can look at our forest land. Um, here, here's our forest land. This is winter access only. This is possible summer access based on soil types and proximity to access roads. So about a third of our entire forest actually even has a potential for summer access, and that's almost an ideal situation. So it's, it's built in that it's going to be a relatively small amount harvested during the summer. <clears throat> so if you take Minnesota's 5.5 billion cord sustainable harvest level, um, as determined by the GEIS a number of years ago, um, the annual amount of forest impacted during the summer would be just slightly over one half of one percent of the forest. So it's, it's really a small percent, even at that maximum harvest level that would be impacted um, typically statewide during the summer season. But if you look at what's been done over the past five or six years when the average harvest rate has been about 2.8 million cords per acre, I mean cords per year, that number is, is just a little over a quarter of a percent of the forest in the state of Minnesota. So, so really the threat of summer harvest is pretty remote apparently by, by those numbers. Just to kind of illustrate it, this is Minnesota's forest. Um, could have been more artistic and made it in the shape of Minnesota, but I was kind of in a hurry. But each one of those little trees would be the annual summer harvest in Minnesota. So just as an exercise, pick a couple of those trees out for your harvest mentally, and uh, we'll see if we hit the bat. You know, that kind of illustrates the remote chance of mortality from harvesting in the summer based on the harvest levels that we have. The other thing in summer harvesting that I, that I think we need to look at is um, the retention that, that we do in the summer and, and how, we, how we look at that. And Rich put together, um, Rich Cordemont, the Assistant Land Commissioner, put together some stuff. I think an important tool for locating wetlands to put buffers around would, would be a, a good way to do that and it's worked out well for us because you get the combination of roost trees, you get the combination of shade to those small wetlands, um, you have a water source adjacent to it, things like that. So here's an area that we have um, aerial photo of, and Rich took the new LIDAR data 
and, and just to see what we could what we could find. So using LIDAR, we really identified here are the wetland areas in this particular site. You kind of put a little green buffer around the wetlands as far as protection, and the end result, basically, now this was by chance. Actually, the forester went out and located all of these and put the buffers on ahead of time. But what a great tool to be able to do that ahead of time and actually let the loggers know, you know, these are the particular areas, um, GPS locate them. These are particular areas where you could leave a buffer around these wetlands, which would serve as, as the retention and potential roost trees. Just a, a new, relatively new tool that I think has a lot of potential. Oops. And here's just quickly an example of um, Dan Gordon, our forester, leaving some of these wetland buffers in a recently summer harvested site. Um, another thing that happens a lot in the summer is, is I think a disproportionate amount of our pine thinnings in Minnesota happen in the summer just because of the soils and the access. Um, typically, you wouldn't think that this would be very good habitat for bats and probably from a roost tree standpoint, it may not be very good habitat. But from what I've learned from Tim and, and looking at different things, you know, after that thinning and after you get that grow, understory growth, um, man, that's like a super highway for foraging. I mean, going between those trees and, and grabbing bugs, not very cluttered, um, a lot of space. So, so that kind of lends, lends me to the topic of maybe we need to plan for retention. Um, a little bit more than just going out on a stand-by-stand -stand basis. Because what we, tend, what we have in Minnesota is we have stand-level guidelines and we have landscape-level guidelines. And the stand-level is probably too small to really plan that out, and the landscape is probably too big. And so we're looking at, you know, <laughs> neighborhood-level planning, which is somewhere in between. Uh, and, and what we do and what we've tried to do is take, say, for example, a four square mile area, about 2,500 acres if you have all the ownership, and just kind of plan out over the course of time your retention and, and your management. So Bob here has a bunch of areas where he's thinned. He had some aspen harvest where he left no retention. He had an aspen harvest here where he left patches. Um, here's a harvest here where a bunch of patches were left. We've got water sources. You've got trails. You, you know, look at it from a, a larger scale and kind of plan over time and space. You know, maybe if you have a, an aspen stand that's 45 cord to the acre, uh, big tooth aspen, and you want to regenerate it, maybe you don't leave reserve patches in that particular area, but you look at the adjacent stands, maybe there are some oak inclusions that can be used. You know, look at it not at a stand-by-stand -stand basis, but a little bit larger scale. Because you can't address every forest value on every acre, and, and that goes with everything, recreation, maximizing timber, wildlife habitat. <clears throat> I think we have to look at what we do in our various neighborhoods. This is a pretty good document that talks about legacy retention and looks at it more of a larger scale, and, and there's some of those on the back table. Um, put out a number of years ago, 2003, and one of the things that kind of looks at a landscape and talks about, they call it nuclei, I call them anchors, um, of, of looking at retention and, and some of the things you can do. I stole this uh, slide from Tim, he sent it to me, but you know, does bat-friendly forestry really work? And, and we don't know, we think so. Um, so what we did, we had an opportunity um, to work with Tim and his crew to actually do a bat survey in one particular area of Aiken County um, on the 14th and 15th of August. So we technically made it within the Fish and Wildlife Service um, period where we could do the survey. We did it up in the Cornish Hardwood area, which maybe many of you have been to. Um, it's our, one of our high conservation forests in Aiken County. It's actually a, a model forest with the Forest Guild. So we thought it made a lot of sense to do it in, in a place like that. Very remote area. Um, probably the nearest residence is, is maybe two, three, four miles from there. So it's a very remote forested area. I think 
Tim can attest, I think it took him an hour and a half round trip to get a Subway sandwich for his crew or something like that. It was <laughs> not the most convenient place to have a crew out in the woods. And here's a picture of uh, the dedication for the model for us a number of years ago. So the goal of the project was really trying to add a little bit to the knowledge base about forest bats in Minnesota and answer a couple of the questions that we were interested in. One of them, what is the bat species composition of this particular area, the Cornish hardwood area? Are northern long-eared bats residents of this area? Are native bats healthy and reproducing? And are there differences based on forestry activity in the area? So this was, was the area. Um, They'd set up four acoustic monitoring sites and one mist net site with two nets in this area. Um, actually, there was another acoustic monitor at the mist net site as well. And this was along, uh, you can't really see it very well, but there's a forest trail that comes up here and then there's a snowmobile trail that crosses here. So it was kind of on an intersection corridor at the edge of a, of a recently harvested uh, patch cut area. So this is the forest management activity that had taken place. There, the state had a aspen harvest about a year ago. This, was, this area was pretty much mature hardwood forest. We had a thin patch cut one year ago, two years ago, and seven years previous to that, there was an aspen harvest there with, with retention. And retention here, as you can see on the state sale. So in all, 2, 000, greater than 2,000 cords had been harvested within a half mile radius of the mist net site within the last two years. So that, you know, if you look at a half mile radius, what's that, 500 acres or so? So, so a lot of uh, harvesting occurring primarily in the winter, but there was, there was habitat alteration within that forest area over a number of years. The acoustic uh, monitors that were set up along there, that's what they look like, Tim had showed you previously. Um, here is a situation where I was bringing the crew some bug spray and giving them some words of wisdom within earshot of one of the acoustic monitors. And basically it picked up what I was telling them and, <laughs> and actually uh, analyzed it well. So this was the seven-year-old aspen type that had been harvested um, that we had one of the acoustic monitors next to. This was an area of the, of the northern area of the, uh, the patch cut with thinning in between and then uh, the more mature forest. So we had monitors in, in, in every one of those sites. And here was actually the mist net that was before it was drawn down across the corridor, one of the mist nets. You couldn't really take a picture of what happened that evening, so I kind of, this kind of created a reenactment, and I just want you to know no bats were harmed during the making of this reenactment, but kind of to set the stage, approximately midnight, um, the moon was coming up between the trees, and the bats came out of the woodwork. <laughs> I never had dreamt in a million years that there could be that many bats out in the forest in the middle of the night. We were sitting at the table analyzing these things. They had to check the mist nets every, about every 10 minutes from 8.30 until 1.30 a.m. And we were sitting at the tables and the bats were flying in between us. I mean, you look up with your spotlight and they're crisscrossing in the sky above you. There were just dozens and dozens of bats out there. And it was pretty cool. Um, and as I said, there weren't many residents within close proximity, but word is there were a number of uh, calls of a little girl screaming in the middle of the night in the woods, and that was, that was me when the, when the bats started coming out. Um, it's kind of freaky until you're sitting there and you realize with the bat researchers that they don't care, you know. They assured me they weren't going to fly in my hair. Um, but uh, they were all over, and it was pretty cool there acrobatic, um, it's, it's pretty neat. Uh, one of the neat things, we were walking towards the mist net and this bat was coming right at us. In April, one of the crew members went like this and that bat flipped over and headed back the other way and got tangled in the mist net. <laughs> it, was, it was just pretty cool. But anyway, the results. Here's a bat caught in the net. This was a northern long-eared bat. Um, they got him in the net. Tim here, they stick them in a sandwich bag, um, paper sandwich bag, and, and weigh each one. And then, uh, as they referred to this as uh, the alien abduction 
for these bats. Um, take pictures, do a ton of measurements. Um, you know, I, I gained a lot of respect for these people and the work they do. Um, they're very professional, very thorough when they do it, and they're very respectful of the bats. I mean, they, they, they took care of them. Um, it, it was kind of a cool experience, and uh, we, we got some good information, um, some good, whoops. So these are the five of the seven bats that we actually caught in the mist net. Northern long-eared bat, there was a, a, a band put on them, like Tim had mentioned. So if somebody finds them again, they'll know where they came from. Little brown bat, eastern red bat, which is a bizarre looking creature up close. Um, um, silver hair bat, we didn't catch one of these in the mist net, but it was detected in the acoustic monitors, uh, a big brown bat. So five out of the seven species were in, were in our managed forest area. And this was kind of the percentage breakdown. I didn't go out the second night. We caught 26 bats the first night. They caught 27 bats the second night. So 53 bats in one mist net site in two nights. I don't know if that's higher than normal or not. But Tim, uh, pretty good. It seemed like you guys, these guys were giddy, so I thought it must be pretty good. Because they'd mentioned, they, geez, we hope you, we catch a bat since you're out here with us, and we, they were all over the place. Many of the bats avoid the mist net. I mean, you can see, they, they, they see it, and they dive away from it, so, so there were a lot of bats out there. But 15 northern long-eared bats in two nights. Little brown bat was the most common species, silver-haired, and one eastern red um, bat we caught. So, to answer our questions, we have a diverse bat population, five out of the seven native species in that particular forest area. Northern long-eared bats were 28% of the netted bats, and they were detected in four out of the five acoustic sites. They were healthy and reproducing. Um, the, uh, the juveniles were the same size as the adults at this particular time. Um, I think the only way, Tim, you told them apart is to shine a light through their wing and look at the fusion of the bones to tell if they were, if they were an adult or a juvenile. Um, so they were pretty much full grown mid-August. The females were done nursing. They, you could tell that anatomically. And the males were getting ready to reproduce. You could tell that anatomically without going into graphic detail. Um, were there differences based on the forestry activity? There were bat, there was bat, pretty good bat activity at every one of the sites, regardless if it was mature forest or disturbed forest. So, so that, to me, that was good information. One site, it's not um, totally significant, but you know, greater than two thor two thousand cords harvested in the past two years within a half mile radius of the mist site, and there was high activity bad activity at, at virtually all of the sites. It seems like the retention of the, as long as there are roost trees around, it seemed like we were pretty good to go. The other thing is, you know, the maternal roosting season, you know, in the internal guidance documents, it was 4, 1 to 9.30. But in mid-August, the females had been done nursing for quite a while. Juveniles were full grown and flying. So that's, I think, some a good indication that, that this, this season, as far as uh, the actual maternal season, could potentially be truncated a bit. So bat-friendly forestry, it's about retaining roost trees. You know, aggregated and even age harvesting is, is the way that I would recommend. Plan for retention at greater than the stand level scale. Um, look, look at a bigger picture, the neighborhood. Prudent harvesting in the roosting season. You know, late spring and early summer are when the pups are flightless in, in, the, in the roost trees and they're vulnerable. Um, but I think in Minnesota, at least in northern Minnesota, the wetlands really limit the summer harvesting we do anyway. Monitor and document. Um, one of the things I did discover through this whole thing is in Minnesota, our forest inventory is inadequate to deal with issues like this when they come up. We've gone to the well the last couple of years looking for funding to upgrade our forest inventory. Um, have been shot down pretty uh, dramatically. Um, but when an issue like this comes up and we need data across the board from all the counties, from the DNR, from all these ownerships, there are different levels of, of inventory data within different counties, within different agencies, and you can't really grab all that information, put it together, and say, here is the status of the forest in Minnesota. I think we really got to 
bring this to the attention in the next year or so that when these things come up, we have to have a detailed inventory to, to deal with the information. And also, I think we have to do a better job of documenting what we leave behind. We typically do that, but we really don't document it consistently across Minnesota as to how many snag trees are we leaving, what percent are we leaving as far as den trees, cavity trees, reserve patches, things like that. I think uh, this is something that we have to do a lot better job of. And, you know, we are going to learn a lot more about these species over the next few years, um, and hopefully... You know, we don't have a lot of restrictions that, that come into play before we can learn how to really manage for these species. The Halloween tour tomorrow, um, we're going to look at a couple sites. Three sites, very accessible, probably not our best bat sites necessarily, but where we've done some things that, that's pretty easy access. Um, and I just want to mention that it is costume optional on Halloween. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if I have any answers, but I'll have a comment. Yeah. Your uh, point about your forest inventory being inadequate, is it because it is so focused on commercial product and species that it's ignoring snakes, culls, all that thing? Is that what you meant? Well, I think that's part of it. I think another part of it is um, between different agencies and organizations, there's been a priority of upkeep of the inventory. So a lot of the inventory is outdated. You know, some counties may have up-to-date inventory, others may not have updated some of their areas for many years. So it's a combination of a lot of things. No, all winter. Yeah. So it wasn't really a, it was more of a habitat disturbance function than it was a, a, a take. Um, annually, like per, what percent we annually impact? It, it's about a third of one percent, you know, right now. And we're kind of at a low. I think at the height, there was maybe four tenths of one percent of the forest was impacted every year by summer harvest. <laughs> it's it's well statewide right now. We're harvesting one percent of the forest entirely. So you're, you're a procurement guy, you know less, probably less than a third of that occurs in the summer. You know, so it's, it's like a quarter of a percent probably. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. I guess that brings me to my question then too. How do you, uh, or what do you say to the people that say, well, if the bat, if northern long-eared bat is listed, and it's such a small, small percentage that's occurring here in the summer, then why is that such a Well, I get, you know, certainly one of the things is that that, that small percent in Minnesota is about a million cords <laughs> annually, you know, and that, that is significant. But I think the other thing is, you know, if, if you truncate all of the harvesting in Minnesota to the four months in the summer, there are going to be a lot of repercussions that, that I think are not anticipated, like um, loggers going out of business, uh, um, loggers aren't, you know, if they're going to have to push all that wood in, in four months, then they're not going to be sorting logs for the sawmill industry. They're not going to be uh, really too willing to do a lot of thinnings and selective harvests or things like that because it just wouldn't be economically feasible. So, so we're going to kind of create a situation where there are unintended consequences, um, not only for the forest industry, but for the management of the forest. Jason.
Well, well, I think that's the hope is that once we have a conservation plans in place that it really recognizes that. And I think the research needs to be done and hopefully speakers coming up will can possibly address some of that stuff. How am I doing for time? Am I? Okay. Which months are summer harvest for your statistics? Um, what I looked at was, uh, I think, May through September. Well, one of the acoustic monitors was it was a, was in a recently harvested patch cut. The other was uh, this one was adjacent to a seven-year-old aspen harvest, and these two were in basically forests that hadn't been harvested in for about at least ten years. That was in the, that was in the thin patch cut where there were patches in, uh, in thinned areas. Well, not necessarily. When I looked at the interim guidance document, this, those dates were for Minnesota. And, but I think they're kind of just uh, preliminary. I think it's going to be going to be nailed down a little later. That's my hope, anyway. Yeah, it was the 14th and 15th is when we were out there. So, so you're saying that the, the late summer, a, a cold late spring could be, could be a factor? Okay, I just want to make sure that wasn't recorded. <laughs> Yeah, that's what. So, so northern long-eared bats are moth eaters, um, primarily. They, they're vicious too. I mean, they were biting the 
biting the heck out of you guys. But their, their jaws aren't even strong enough really to, to do much on those smaller bats. Okay. Thanks.